Hey everybody, my name is Jack O'Halloran. I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of Scale Labs. We're the core team behind the Scale Network. Pleasure to be here today again at Reimagine. Excited to get into some deep conversation about crypto. Hello everybody and welcome back to Reimagine 2021. This is our seventh conference and a monthly series of events bringing you nothing but the best projects, uh, bright minds and leaders in the space. We've been fortunate enough to invite many talented individuals and teams uh, to come speak with us, providing updates, insights, and all the above uh, that's happening in crypto. Um, I'll be your host today, Adam, from the Mousebell team, uh, where we focus on early stage investments through our accelerator, providing development support uh, to a number of growing projects with Mousebell Engineering, and, as well as education within our Mousebell University program. Um, our main objectives are, and goals are pretty simple. It's increasing adoption, use cases, and real world applications. Um, you know, we seek to educate our audience and, and uh, on blockchain by helping them understand crypto's like real impact. Again, thank you for tuning in to Reimagine 2021. I'm um, having an exciting interview for you today. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce you to Jack O'Halloran from uh, the CEO of Scale Labs and co-founder of the Scale Network. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to participate again, Jack. Uh, welcome back. You know, how you doing? Doing good. Thanks, Adam. Pleasure to be here. Excited to talk crypto and actually talk about some real use cases. I think uh, I think that's the fun stuff, right? It's fun yeah, exactly. About, but let's talk about impact. That's why we're all doing this. <laughs> exactly, and you know, for all of you that might have, might have missed Jack's first interview with us a, a couple months ago, um, great content, great material, great interview. You can always find that at the Reimagined YouTube channel. Uh, we can find Jack there. So I'm hoping to kind of add on to that and contribute more uh, more to the discussion as possible. Again, Jack, you can find him on YouTube as well for, for other uh, fantastic interviews and, and podcasts. So hopefully today I keep it fresh. Um, so let's go ahead and get on with it. Um, you know, blockchain is kind of a buzzword, right? Uh, and little do people know, you know, maybe on the tech side or, or non-tech side, I guess, uh, that cryptography has been around for years. Um, distributed systems been around for years, encryption, right, all the above. And now it's just kind of snowball technologies advanced uh, from those early days on, on to now. But, you know, before we get into scale and, and all those use cases, what were you doing with these systems that ultimately led you to scale? But, but what was your involvement and what did you think of kind of technology during, uh, you know, the early days leading up to what we call blockchain now, you know, post-2008? Yeah, I think it, it's been an interesting evolution. And, and I think we all have to recognize we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So these cryptography inventions and academic uh, milestones were actually started, you know, hitting in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And so you see, you know, what we're using uh, when you, know, you see Bitcoin, like that's a culmination of many, many years of research. So for me, uh, my first foray into digital currencies was I started a company called Incentiline in 2008, and it was a digital currency platform that entities like NASA could use to do better resource allocation. So we saw an opportunity to actually use these currencies that use cryptography and use game theory and uh, economic theory to try to drive in, uh, alignment of incentives and resource allocation. And you know, to make a long story short, we were very early and too early. Uh, but it was a great introduction to this, you know, and it actually led us on to doing something very successful. After that, it was a good segue into a successful company. But um, I learned a lot through that. And I also was with a company called Good Technology that was uh, had some of the you know highest end crypto with regards to like messaging and like the U.S. Senate, White House, FBI, um, 90 of the Fortune 100 used this product. And in 2005, uh, when I was working there, and my co-founder of Scale Labs, Stan Cladco, actually was running a cryptography lab in the early 2000s and did wow. our cryptography search. So that was our first kind of interaction with each other. But, but this stuff's been around for a while, to your and, point. And, and when, you, when we talk about digital assets or, or cryptocurrency in the sense pre-2008, what is, what is the currency or like, why was that needed at that time? Like what, what value did it have? in terms of, was it a packet of, of information? Was it data? Um, you know, why wasn't another source used or what was the main benefit of having a cryptocurrency digital asset, I guess? 
You know, so at the end of the day, it's all about incentive alignment. And, um, and so we, our theory and premise was if people had to pay for things, they're all of a sudden going to be a lot more honest about how much of how much they need and when they need it. And so you take an example of scientists competing for wind tunnel time at NASA. And everybody says, oh, I need it tomorrow and I need it for X amount of time. If everybody has a set amount of money and, you know, they're using these NASA dollars to pay, all of a sudden, like, you know what, if I wait a day later, no one else wants it. Like the supply demand curve, the elastic curve tells me it's going to cost half as much. And you start getting these natural settlements and uh, of, of resource alignment because people actually have to put their money where their mouth is. And what happens in Fortune 500 companies is, and like Intuit, for example, like everybody wanted the legal time. Like I need the legal team. I need this contract tomorrow. But if all of a sudden you have a scarce resource and then you have to bid on the resource, on the asset that you want, People are more honest about what they need when. And that was the premise of Incentaline when we were working on that in 2008, which I have to say, people looked at us like we were nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was the, the application like in terms of the, the resource alignment? Was there a need? Was there a demand for this type of uh, application in terms of leveraging crypto? But not only that, like, like you mentioned, the, uh, the, the currency aspect the, of, of of that, that ecosystem? Like, was there demand for that? Yeah. So you know what? There was a ton of demand and we kind of met the crosshairs of a, of a market collapse in late 2008. And all of a sudden people quit investing in innovative things and yeah. went back to just absolute requirements. And that's why the company ended up shifting off of that vision. But if you think about it, what we were trying to do was provide enterprises a better way to help divide resources up and allocate resources and, and streamline processes. And you can put a bunch of planning and central planning into place, or you can like align a currency and, you know, look at the behavioral economics of a situation. And we felt like that was something that maybe took more work up front, but could add huge value later. Now, we also miss the mark in terms of digital currencies and that I think we've learned that they're more valuable when they're applied in open source, decentralized community owned environments with scarcity elements and extrinsic value. This was you know, a model of how that could be used, but it was designed to be used inside of an institution. And so, uh, you know, but I have to say, I think it was a phenomenal idea. I'm excited for somebody to go out and do that and build that yeah. because um, there's, I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think it's a great business. And so no one has achieved it yet for inside of entities. I think we're seeing it yeah. come to light outside of entities, but um, there's, there's growth in, in both areas. And I, I kind of just thought about it and you touched on it. It might, might kind of derail me a little bit, but let, let's kind of take it into, and I'll come back full circle. I think for those watching, understanding kind of how all the alignments you just said, the incentives, the gamification, the economics or tokenomics kind of in the blockchain crypto space um, of, of how things work, operate, the purpose, play into like where we're at today. We're in 2021. This was back in 2000, what was it? Eight, you said, or, you know, yeah, 2008. Yeah. yeah, late yeah, 2008, which is kind of cool. And the topic of this discussion for me is kind of highlighting the purpose of blockchain outside of Bitcoin. You know, everybody hears Bitcoin and, and kind of they think it's just this currency and a substitute dollar and like, but it's beyond that, right? We're talking about the tech underneath it that is now being applied. That's been applied, I guess, you know, for the last you know decades. And now it's kind of culmination to, to where we're at today. Now, were you familiar with digital assets like in 2004 with like Brock Pierce and kind of what they were doing as well, like uh, within games and mining gold? Are you familiar with that landscape? You know, I, I was just from a gaming perspective. So I was yeah. like into gaming and, and, and actually really into gaming just from an intellectual capacity. Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, I wanted to understand gaming and actually at one point almost started a, a gamification uh, B2B gamification engine to like, you know, drive sales teams and motivate yeah. people uh, with leaderboards and taking these, these elements of, of gaming and bring them into enterprise software that that piece in, interested me and, in you know, I was a pretty casual gamer, yeah. um, got more into it when the iPhone launched and there's like, For you sure. know, Supercell and, you know, the that whole suite of games but, um, you know, for me, it was more, uh, you know, I I, I think the first introduction of Bitcoin I had was 2011. Yeah. So I was very late to this whole Nick Szabo era uh, cypherpunk yeah. scene. But yep. um, it, and I was living I lived in Palo Alto in 2007, 2006. And some friends from like that group of people were like really on tech trends. And 
I got the white paper sent to me in 2011 for Bitcoin. And, you know, I still didn't recognize the power that it had. But I think circling back to your original point, like when I think of Bitcoin and I think of blockchain and I think of cryptocurrencies, I think people need to think about it in the lens of user owned blank. Yep. Yep. Bitcoin, user owned money or store of value, right? It's user owned yep. gold. Okay. Digital gold. Right. Um, you think about all of these assets and you think about user owned exchange, right? Decentralized exchanges, um, user owned financial applications in the DeFi category, right? We're removing these constructs of power and authority where we have middlemen and we're letting people and workers and open source software be the facilitators of these new uh, business, business models, yeah. essentially. No, no, totally. And, and I bring that up because, you know, we, we just talked about cryptocurrency in 2008, kind of the way you're using it internally. Um, you know, there's some of these other stories, right, uh, in actual gaming. Um, and people, you, you guys can Google it online, like Brock Pierce had a, a booming business of millions of dollars of business way before Bitcoin, of in-game assets, digital assets, how to extract it, and kind of this whole understanding, like you said, the middleman, you know, owner-centric, uh, control data and and anyways it, it's kind of it's kind of it's it, it's it's crazy which also ties into like my next question of your background and i haven't interviewed anybody yet where you've experienced the mobile development like machine learning and ai and then now blockchain and so explain to me kind of your process from your lens, this evolution, because it applies really to blockchain from like the early days of mobile. Like, did it make sense? You know, this was before iPhones and like iPhones were, were booming and you had two different sets of code, uh, you know, one for, you know, uh, Apple and one for Android. And now actually they've made it easier where you can develop, right. Like kind of, you know, one code, one code base for, for both operating systems, which is great because now it's streamlined applications for, you know, it's kind of boom. So from your lens, you're kind of seeing the same infrastructure development. And for mm -hmm. my viewers might think like, you know, this is new, but you've seen this, this evolution of, of different development, um, technical emerging trends in specific periods of time, which maybe you can give me some insight on how you see blockchain kind of, you know, um, history repeating itself a little bit. Yeah. So I, um, I would say I, I like to think I was on top of both those trends early, but I have to say that the mobile trend, I just got very fortunate. And my first job out of college, I managed to like get the right introduction and get, you know, yeah. land a job at a really hot mobile company. So that was like less of me being a visionary, even though I, Hey, I, I was, I saw it. I saw the value, For Sure. but, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. So at good technology, we had, 90 of the Fortune 100 and similar numbers for the, of the Fortune 1000, every major government institution. What it was, it was, it was a way to, just, you know, do corporate and mobile email and device management of uh, for enterprises. So um, now everybody just, you know, brings their own iPhone to work and you can plug into the systems of the enterprise. But back then, you actually had to have IT managing and giving you an application for which email you could use. And it was people were using Palm Trios, Blackberries, like the iPhone didn't exist. There was no Kia devices. There were Windows mobile devices. It was all pre-Android, okay, and pre-iOS. So um, what we did is we had this enterprise platform. What we realized was we had such a stranglehold on the enterprise mobile uh, uh, just market share that we could be a source for applications to integrate. So we launched an application program. You could have, you know, you know, these mobile uh, mobile applications on the good platform. And we thought people were going to be running from each direction to deploy. But guess what? The device speeds, we were on 2G in terms of Wi-Fi. Battery life was like four or five hours, six hours <laughs> max. Um, you know, the memory, the, the storage capabilities in these phones, the compute power. I mean, we're, it, you know, a cal it was like a similar to a calculator in terms of power compared to like, an iPhone is stronger than the you know most powerful laptop of that time, right? Yeah. And so we just, frankly, we're in an infrastructure sticking point. And I think we only had three different applications ever come build on that application suite, even though there were, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of users at the world's most expensive companies, but the ex user experience was so poor. And so I like to tell that story because fast forward three years later, the iPhone launches. We, we got to 3G. 
we uh, the battery life, the storage capabilities, the memory in these devices, just just yeah. all these things came together at the same time. And what we fixed was the user experience. So people were betting on the tech, but the UX was broken. And then you know what? A year later, Supercell launches uh, a game, and there's a million people playing each other per second in real time across you know hundred different countries all over the world, like real time playing people, um, not sending a message and like waiting five minutes for it to get yeah. to the other side of the world, okay? And, and so then it was a transformational experience. The number of mobile users skyrocketed, the number of applications, and mobile quit being a thing. It, all, it became a component like the internet, right? There used to be this category we think of just mobile. Now, mobile is a piece of every business strategy and technology. And so crypto, look where we are in crypto. We're at this place where user experience is kind of broken. Power users know how to get in there and get value. Um, but we need to get to a point where normal people with normal technology skills can interface with blockchains and get the, the benefits of being part of user owned blank. And so where, where are we at? So for the viewers out there, you know, we have some that are just getting into the space. We have a lot of college students, which, which, you know, of, um, and by the way, uh, everybody watching, we do have a scale workshop. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, awesome workshop. Just go to the Reimagine YouTube channel, scale workshop. It's there. Um, you, you can learn all, all kinds of things on that on that tutorial. It's a great guide. I think their VP of engineering put that on. So it's, it's been awesome. Um, okay, so back, back to here. So yeah, where are we now? Where are we now, right? That's the... Yeah, so like, yeah, and, and to even tie it up, even for people watching, right? Like the internet was made up of a bunch of protocols. That thing was operating for only the Department of Defense back in the 70s and like governments and, and then and then researchers. And it kind of didn't start picking up, right? We had these big old clunky machines, you know, you, you know the client side, you know, the, the server. Um, now everything's up in the cloud and everything's kind of fruition. So if we kind of relate that to blockchain mm -hmm. and, and kind of your discussion going back to mobile, where are we at now? So we have protocols, you know, uh, Ethereum launched in 2014-ish. Um, everybody's still trying to work out the kinks. We have everybody else, you know, next generation blockchains. But from your perspective, and maybe this ties into scale on some of the infrastructure, right, problems and challenges going back to, to scalability and kind of like um, the logic that's put on Ethereum and how you got, you know, tie it into like from those experiences to where we're at today in 2021. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, when we started Scale, Stan and I, who have to say it, Stan's a technical visionary, 20 plus years of cryptography experience and networking experience, and he's a physics PhD, he's one of the people that built the Java virtual machine, um, was part of a cryptography startup with Dan Bonet back in 2000. He's got a ton of cryptography oh, wow. experience. So, and, you know, I have a lot of platform experience in enterprise and, and SaaS and, and, you know, machine learning and AI, which also, you know, another story for another day of how I saw that progress and and kind of go through the same challenges before it hit it it, it hit its stride. And um, so here we are, like when we were looking at building scale, what we realized was application specific blockchains was our view of the future. How do we get to a point where we can have hundreds of millions of users? And that was, and if we designed something and it wouldn't be able to support hundreds of millions of users, we were like, you know, it didn't work. It wasn't going to yeah. work. And we know that scale as a piece of this ecosystem is only one piece. We need a lot of continued improvement from wallets, fiat, fiat to crypto on ramps, um, uh, user experience with L2, and obviously like layer two or blockchain scaling. Now, what we saw was if I'm using my email, I'm not using the same database as you know my ride sharing platform. If I take a Uber or a Lyft, it doesn't cost me more because a lot of people are using email or Twitter at that time. They all have their own backends. And blockchains have a share value clearly when they all have one you know, aligned database, foundational database. But we saw was an opportunity to have these databases sitting on top that were owned by the applications themselves, just like we see in today's internet, where you have all these weekly coupled databases that can talk and sync and interact with each other but they're their own database. They're their own pooled compute resource. And that's why Amazon AWS is so successful in Google Cloud, right? So we thought, hey, there's an opportunity for a Web3 cloud to exist here that one can connect to that foundational database, which is Ethereum. Two, needs to be compatible and interoperable with the Ethereum ecosystem because that's where developers are building on. That's where all the tooling and the 
the applications are building for. And then three could connect to wallets so that you could have a user experience where the user doesn't need to be an engineer or a PhD in order to use a simple application. And I think a lot of the efforts to improve blockchain forget that the requirement is that it's a non-starter if it's too complicated. We're just not going to get to the next level. So and that's when it, our, And when did you first come across? So uh, let's see, Scale launched in end of 2017, 2018. You guys were rocking and rolling. Ethereum came out in 2014. Bitcoin came out in 2008. Did you think Bitcoin was, was an option? Or like no, I, when, when Ethereum hit, when Ethereum launched, were you like, wow, this is great, but it needs work, but we can work with this? So for me, I I have to say, I've you know been a huge advocate of Bitcoin since 2013. I learned about it in 2011. And for me, I never saw it as anywhere near a like competitive thing to yeah. Ethereum. I kind of yeah. saw them as filling, because you know, seeing technology ecosystems evolve, you realize that you need holes filled in every major area. And one thing's not going to fill every hole. And so I think maximalism is really often an under, not a misunderstanding of value and, and function. And so I'm a huge proponent of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's role is over here. When you think about Ethereum, the Ethereum virtual machine and having this programmable money component into logic with smart contracts was a, was why we just 100% were focused on Ethereum the whole time. And and even in, in 2017, the developer community was booming. Massive. And, I'll tell you, and, I'll, and yeah. you know what? We I was at every single hackathon um, between ETH Berlin and August of 2018, every single Ethereum hackathon, all the way up until the pandemic hit. I didn't miss a single one. Uh, and we were, the scale team was there supporting it. And you know what? That developer community just got stronger through this down period, this like crypto winter, because People, and you know, you were there, you look at the teams that were there. I, I remember, you know, seeing the one inch team and the Ave team and yeah, yeah. the graph team and the scale, you know, there's all of these teams and you know what, we're just sitting there. Nobody's there other than developers. And now I think you'd have one of these conferences. It'd be loaded with people again, but um, you know, that the Ethereum community had an incredible uh, developer and community uh, yeah. involvement, which is also what excited us about, about that. No, totally. And that kind of comes up basically a, a topic of discussion when talking about other blockchains that are, you know, being developed, created that were launched post Ethereum. And one of the one of the advantages that Ethereum has was that developer community, the growth. And not only just from um from the foundation itself, like the Ethereum Foundation or whatnot, but like YouTube channels, documentation, like podcasts, like so you're definitely right in terms of that. And, you know, what about the scalability issues and challenges that Ethereum's working out? How does that play, you know, how does that affect your guys' strategy, which kind of leads me to, are you just Ethereum only? Do you kind of see five, you know, years down the road being interoperable with, with other layer one, you know, base protocols? You know, so when we think of scale, we think of it as this Web3 cloud of Ethereum compatible blockchains. And we're betting on the Ethereum ecosystem. We're betting on ETH and the Ethereum mainnet having this foundational value. And then this execution and activity happens above it in, in other blockchains. And, and um, we think, you know, we are strong believers in the network effects around, around scale. But um, when you think about it, let's say there's another token like Bitcoin or other tokens that are highly valuable and a developer who builds within the Ethereum ecosystem yeah. says, hey, I want my users to be able to use this stable coin from this other network or to be able to use Bitcoin in this application. That's where scales interoperability takes place. But we're not envisioning being, you know, tacking uh, a scaling structure onto other blockchains until we really see the need. I mean, we're, we're it's, hey, it's, it's all about, uh, you know, product, uh, product market fit. And right yeah. now the market is so massive for Ethereum that um, it's more than enough, I think, you know, and, and we'll see how things grow and evolve. But if it stays where it is in terms of developer traction, I think it would be misguided effort to be spending too much time anywhere else. And, and let's kind of catch up our viewers here. Obviously, you, you've done uh, an interview with us, so I don't want to rehash kind of scale overall, but let's let's tie this into kind of what, what you guys have done 
to help that that second layer because you're not really a layer two. I've heard you say that. Not consider you know you don't think yourself as a layer two. You think mm -hmm. yourselves of a, a different kind of hybrid. You know side chain um, to the ecosystem. But let's let's kind of fill the viewers in on how scale what the product market fit is that you guys see that you guys attacked. Yeah, and so you you could think of scale as being this kind of. Uh, this big pool of compute resource, right? It's like, imagine there's a big, like a big lake and that's all the compute power. And it's provided by all the people that run these nodes or computers that they add to the network. And when they do that, they get paid every month by putting that resource there. And then the Ethereum mainnet, these contracts on the Ethereum mainnet, you can think of them as a brain. What they do is they tell the scale network how to kind of you know, and so a developer says, hey, I want to run a gaming application or a DeFi application. And it's like there's this bucket that goes in the pool of water and it's given to that developer of compute resource. And that developer can use that as much as they want. And every month, some of that water goes into the pool and some goes in the pool back into the bucket. And what you're doing, you're getting this pooled security resource because to attack any bucket, you need to attack, like probabilistically be able to attack two thirds of the bigger pool. And so it's a way to share resource, give every developer their own blockchain and use the Ethereum mainnet to orchestrate the really critical security components, mm -hmm. such as where those buckets of water go and where, you know, which validators basically work for which, which developers and how are they, how are they switched out and rotated to uh, maintain the security properties of a big blockchain while giving agility of small blockchain. That's what scale does. And so some people say layer twos if you're running consensus on your on the network, it's not a layer two, um, it's a layer one. Other people would say, if you're tacking a blockchain onto another blockchain, there's the first blockchain, the second one, then it's a layer two. So there's an argument. We don't worry too much about what it is, but we think of scale as this, you know, hybrid thing that doesn't really exist anywhere else. Where a a, a network like Ethereum controls the network of scale, and then they work in a symbiotic manner to support applications. How close, how close do you work with, uh, do you work closely with the Ethereum Foundation at all? Uh, we know them fairly well um, and, you know, work a lot with them through different events and community yeah, building yeah. and, uh, but, you know, it's, it's all open source. I think the Ethereum Foundation is, you know, my view is their mandate is to grow Ethereum. And then there's also subsects of researchers that are, you know, focused on different initiatives throughout, uh, throughout the code base, but um, we definitely have a lot of uh, a lot of interaction, and you know, you think of scale. Scale is devoted entirely to supporting Ethereum, right? Yeah. So, um, so, do you follow any other layer ones then? Like anything kind of catch your eye that's that's interesting, that's evolved, that's next generation, um, that's kind of like, all right, you know, I don't know, they're onto something. Obviously, this whole thing that we thought, you know, in the past, um, uh, you know, build it and they will come, right? Like, didn't quite pan out. You know, it's a lot more community driven, a lot more, you know, yeah. uh, available resources, um, the network effects and all that. Are you not following anything else in the space? No, I mean, I, I, and hey, I'm good friends with a lot of these yeah. teams that are building, like love the Solana team. We've done a lot of events with them, the near team, um, you know, there, there's, you know, there's, yeah. there's really uh, like the Cosmo, Cosmos, Polkadot, um, uh, yeah, there, there's just some, I think, really amazing tech being built. And I think that the outstanding question is that everyone has is how will uh, yeah. you know, this evolve? Will Ethereum gobble up all the business because developers are just investing into the smart contract language of Ethereum and there's so many, so much resourcing and tooling there? Or will you see another layer one be so differentiated and modern that people, they just swallow up the business? And, or will the layer twos or hybrid layer twos like scale be able to support the Ethereum network in a viable enough fashion. Um, and then, you know, and that even grows when you get ETH2 plus layer two efforts. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how the network effects come together. And, you know, hey, I, 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 like I said, I've got friends and appreciate uh, the people at the other layer ones. And, and I think they're adding tremendous value um, whether or not they end up being successful in terms of uh, getting users and having transactions on their blockchains because, and I think a lot of them will, like we'll see a lot of success, but um, right now my bet is on Ethereum and that's why, that's why we're there. We believe in that ecosystem. 
Nice, nice. No, that that's good. My you know, yeah, nobody, answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, we we have a lot of partners too, like on our end. You know, different uh, different layer ones, and it's just interesting. And in I don't know what's going to happen either. You know, and I think there's going to be. I think there's definitely going to be like a few, right? There's going to be some niche ones. What's your take on like? like private versus public blockchains. We don't have to spend too much longer. I was just thinking about your background in enterprise. We just mm-hmm. talked about kind of the open source network. We just talked about like tokens being involved, but I've never heard of the crypto side from like the NASA, like, you know, pre-Bitcoin. And, and you said earlier that, that it's kind of, it's coming full circle now, but what's your take quickly on, on like private blockchains versus public and like, you know, one not having a token, you know, obviously versus kind of the alignment uh, on the token side. You know, I'll, I'll say there, there's a lot of value for enterprises using private blockchains in some use cases, but to me, that market size is really small compared okay. to the value enterprises will get by adopting open networks and not using okay. private blockchains. Because private blockchains at the end of the day, at the, sometimes you're like, why are we using a blockchain? And you go back to this user-owned X or user-owned Y. Like, for sure. And if you, you know, if you have a bunch of companies that don't trust each other, and then there's people that run these nodes that basically run a software system. Like, you know, these are symmetrical databases. And if everyone trusts the databases and they're probably like, why, why do it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> or just have like a two node blockchain. It's just, uh, and so I think the, what we're finding, and there's a, there's a partnership that scale labs is introducing that will be announced very soon when in, in the enterprise is the enterprise is really starting to recognize value of open networks. Yeah. And we're gonna see enterprises start getting in and launching products that are that need open blockchains, that need people running nodes that aren't companies that uh, you know, give trustless value to applications. And so that piece is coming. I, being an enterprise person, didn't wanna go target that space initially because that's that's not where the action is. All the yeah. 10,000 developers, you know, or or more, you know, 100,000 developers working around Ethereum and uh, in the startup landscape of like, you know, the is is dwarfing the use cases right now we see in the enterprise, but that will shift and we'll start seeing more enterprise growth. Um, that's not think, private blockchains. Yeah, do you think, uh, so... Do you think the use case is yet to be found? I guess, um, you know, we I've seen this private side. We work with enterprises, and like mm-hmm. they're trying to figure it out. You know, we've chatted with the, you know, the IBMs of the world and the Oracles and all that. And like, I was surprised to hear the success rate. The tech was there. The success rate was like five percent, and it was just because there was no understanding, like the business model. You know, how to plug it in, how to use it. So what you're saying is, and, and but I've also known that the public uh, blockchain space and open sources is where it's at, but I guess a use case is still yet to be found then. You know what? I So here's a use case, for example, it's these, it's these hybridized models. So look at Reddit. Reddit's launching, like tokenizing this group and like letting this token play a role and, you know, be, and they're not coming in and just saying like, we're running this token on our own. What they're doing is they're bootstrapping this community and building this network effect within their platform. And so that's that's one model. And I think you'll see enter enterprises and businesses that aren't winning, that don't dominate the market. They don't have 99% of the market share. They're going to say, hey, we're going to give up power and control in return for more growth. And it won't always just be like, you know, a fair launch DAO model of like, you know, a DeFi pool, right? It's going to be yeah. companies that, you know, yeah. Might leverage these network effects and they give power and control to users and they compete with centralized counterparts. I, I'm excited about that. Yeah, no. And, and to kind of, since we've been talking a little bit of history in and out of this conversation, same thing with cloud, right? Like, I mean, who would have thought um, you were going to like have your servers in the cloud and not like on the premise, right? Like on your actual yeah. property. And so kind of the same thing, you know, the last few years, was like, why would they give up, you know, this trust and, you know, immutability kind of advantages and, and, um, but I guess like, as, as I can tell recently, I've known this, that they were going to go public, but it, but it's kind of up in the air, but now they're starting to recognize the, the innovation side of it is really kind of on the, on the public ledger side. Yeah. When I, 
when I first, uh, one of my companies that I'd started before was called Octana. It's a machine learning, like artificial intelligence company. It's all software as a service in the cloud. And we're out selling to the world's largest biotechs and pharmaceutical companies. And, and at first, they're, I bet four out of five CIOs would say, oh, no, we're not going to run this unless I can get the servers in pre on premise. And we, we'd say, sorry, we can't do that. This yeah. is SaaS. Go here. There's a million piece, pieces of documentation you can read from salesforce.com and why it's better to use a configured and not customized product in the cloud. And, you know, eventually that shifted entirely. And there's only one company I knew of that just wouldn't shift. And that CIO got fired the next year. Okay. And like everybody's recognized that the cloud, you know, even other like you're putting your most valuable data in someone else's database, not your own. And that was mind blowing. And I yeah. think we're going to see that transformation happen For in the sure. enterprise with blockchain as well. No, that, that, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of where, where, I, where I'm seeing kind of in the space right now. And since you've had these conversations kind of with CIOs and you've had startups in the past, um, this is kind of before we get into some use cases and, and I kind of want to learn like how you guys attract a developer community. But when you were, when you were launching scale and you've had startups, what was like compare and contrast some of those discussions and we don't have to spend in a whole lot of time here, but talking about machine learning and AI. And when you brought up blockchain here, I'm in San Francisco. Some of the like investors were like, I'm not investing in blockchain. And then that's kind of like saying I'm not investing in AI or like machine learning. It's kind of unique, you know, and that, now they're coming around to it, right? What was your take on like approaching the investor community on scale? Were they already like used to blockchain crypto? Were they like, oh, I'm not into this? How did they like comprehend what you were pitching? I mean, it's 2021, makes sense now, but you did this in, you know, in the early years. So what was kind of those, the, the conversations during that period? Yeah. And hey, I have to give credit to the, the investors that did back us yeah. and I, who are traditional enter, or traditional Silicon Valley. And, and so you look at Signia Ventures, Venture Partners. Flood and, thanks for, and thanks for saying traditional because that was like kind of, I, I didn't throw it in there, but that was the other thing too, like non-traditional you know, investors yeah. uh, were like, no, and you'd had to go to like the crypto, like VC mm -hmm. world. Uh, but that's kind of coming for a circle, but didn't mean to cut you off, but thanks for clarifying that because, you know, we have entrepreneurs right now. We have founders, we have students, we have projects mm -hmm. and startups, like trying to get off the ground and, and they're trying to get their pitch down. And, and, you know, you were ahead of your time a little bit kind of in the space, right? Pitching this thing. So yeah, continue on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, yeah. And so we were able to, thankfully insignia and floodgate are top tier uh, traditional Silicon Valley venture funds. And I think they believed in us and in the vision. But then for the next round, I have to tell you, we um, I we got some hard nose from traditional funds just being like, I don't get it. Like you yeah. don't make a profit. You mean your company won't, can't control and change the software without community involvement and the community owns the code and you're gonna open source everything. And <laughs> the money I give you, you're gonna give it to a foundation in a different country because so that the community can own it. And we're like, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. And they thought complete we were opposite, right? <laughs> complete opposite of what they're used to. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, you know, then Multicoin, I have to, you know, give them yeah. credit. They stepped up and led our first kind of crypto native round. And uh, I have Kyle Samara, by the way. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, you know, they, I think they believed in us. And then a lot of other phenomenal uh, funds came in around that. And, you know, that was easier being able to go and pitch to crypto funds because, they get it if they if you all those things I just called out earlier. If yeah. you weren't doing those things, guess what? You weren't getting their money For because sure. they know the power of that. They know the requirement of decentralization from a functionality perspective, community perspective, growth perspective, and as I think a lot of people are finding a compliance perspective. Yeah. And if you are you know building software you own that's not open source, it's not community con contributed, it's not community run. You're not, you know, that's not a decentralized blockchain. That's a security. You know? it's yes. like, so, um, yeah, but it's interesting to see this involvement. So my advice to people out fundraising are, you know, and this is something Floodgate told me once, uh, uh, Arjun, who is, uh, who's a really, really wise person. He said, our philosophy is sell Bibles to the Christians. Meaning if you want to have high sales, don't try to like 
you know, change people's religion. Yeah. yeah. Evangelize the people who are ready to buy. For sure. And, um, and, you know, and that's true for your customers and your investors. Yeah. And understand it. Yeah. Do you think they're, do you think they're coming around now? Like, do you have people coming back from the traditional side? Like, Hey, by the way, yeah, you guys are doing really, they, yeah. They know yeah. that it's not going away. And I yeah, think people yeah. recognize, and you know, you look at a category like NFT. Yeah. But even I think I underestimated the impact and how much power these things would have and how much value people would put in these. And you, I mean, look at that industry that's just booming right now. Right. And so, um, and I always believed in it, but I, I was surprised by the growth that it's had. And I think, you know, I, that gives me a little empathy for investors who looked at this and kind of like, Oh, whatever, but you know, it's not going away. It's yeah. getting bigger and bigger. And the younger generation that controls technology shifts and growth in markets is really getting behind it. And they're knowledgeable about crypto. They're knowledgeable about decentralization and blockchains and NFTs. And I think that market is like getting older and then in a you know more powerful economic position. And we're gonna start seeing like internet type growth in this category over the next five to 10 years. So <clears throat> let's bring this full circle here. I wanna get into some use cases, some applications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was reading up and, and you know, your team put out uh, some material. And I think for our viewers, we've just talked about, I've tried to keep this more kind of real world, right? Like how, how do our users, our, our viewers, like see what we're building, what we're doing. It's, it's not that foreign. It's very history driven in terms of like communities, like participation, engagement, you know, um, and it's all being applied into tech. Uh, so it's kind of cool. So what kind of, I have a few use cases and, and maybe you can just give me your thoughts on how scale, yeah. uh, you know, is being used, being leveraged, however you want to take it. But well, well first use case right now, is we're talking about DeFi, that's kind of been the boom and, you know, all of these projects, you know, you know, ha have come out. How has scale played its part in the DeFi space? I mean, DeFi is going to be a huge, huge category for scale. Uh, you think about uh, the low hanging fruit right now is decentralized finance and gaming for everywhere, you know, every part of, of crypto and Web3 growth. And it's going to go into these other areas to user owned economy, um, you know, Web3, pure Web3 with like social media platforms, um, uh, different marketplace environments. But right now, DeFi is, is massive. And we're actually scale. There's a new features being launched, new security features, new um, user experience features through different wallet providers. And the goal is to make it as easy as possible and secure as possible to go and interact and, and leverage DeFi. And if I have to, the other day I was, you know, I was on Uniswap and I spent, I didn't actually go through the transaction because it was too expensive. I, I was trying to swap. I was just trying to get, I think $500 of ETH and I was swapping USD into ETH because I needed it for a, the ETH for a business function. And it was for $500, it was a hundred dollar gas fee. <laughs> so I was like, why am I, you know, I can't do that. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, People need to, uh, you know, we need, and hey, Uniswap and Ethereum and, you know, all the efforts happening, these problems will be fixed. And that's, that's sure. a problem that scale is really focusing on fixing. And, um, and I'm sure uh, we'll see big projects come on to scale. And we'll also see new projects be launched, like you've seen uh, across the DeFi ecosystem as new scaling platforms launch. It's almost like there's this like, microcosm of an economy on every single fast and ethereum compatible blockchain you've seen like you know it's like in a typical like physical environment there's a car dealership and a coffee shop and you know a yeah. gas station and a shop and a grocery store and like you can kind of take those those like common categories of blockchain and you saw it on binance smart chain and see these things popping up on matic and and scale is going to start popping up you know there'll be the similar characters and then you're going to see uh, see these businesses flourish and then kind of battle for users across their environments yeah. and ones that are just natively on the main net will then connect into winning platforms or multiple layer two platforms and just get more extensive reach too. That's another another way I think we're going to see growth. Great, Grant. Some other use cases is like data custody and privacy, you know, content streaming, um, you know, trustless sports betting and like prediction markets. Mm -hmm. um, are you following any of these kind of dApps being kind of built within your network? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we're, I mean, we're excited about, you know, the best part about my job is I get to just talk to developers all day. Yeah. 
and it's fun. You're out talking to people that are building in these new categories, like you mentioned, and you're just like, you recognize that it's, you know, it's like this homebrew crew of Apple and you just see like the smart minds that are dabbling in the space and that are building things and they're believing and they're seeing, you know, they're seeing the path before everyone else does. And, and it's inspiring. It's uh, so I'm, I'm really pumped, excited for all of these projects to be launching on scale and, and just for us to try to be able to support these developers. There's just so many awesome creative people building really cool security software that has yeah. great implications. The last couple of questions. We got a few minutes before we jump off. Um, you talked about like working with developers. What has scale done to kind of increase that growth? What has scale done to provide the resources, um, the tooling, the infrastructure to make it easier for developers to uh, to log on? You know, we have like a lot of developers, you know, watching Reimagine overall. You know, the the scale workshop is online for you that have, might have missed it. Um, it. That's great. Some great info there. What have you guys done to kind of bring in, you know, the developer talent? Yeah. So we, you know, one thing we've done is, you know, so you think about scale labs, we're a core team. We want to support the growth of the scale network. And what we did, what we don't have, we actually don't have any salespeople. We only have a, a solutions engineering team. And it's really like, like a high powered developer relations arm <laughs> where the goal of this team is to just go out and help people build on scale, make sure that, you know, they're working with product to make sure, ensure documentation is good, that new features are coming down the pipeline and getting their right place on the roadmap um, helping uh, build, you know, tools to easily deploy scale to manage it, um, helping people understand the how the code works, how to test against uh, the code. And uh, Christine Perry, who did the workshop, uh, she's she's VP yeah. of Solutions Engineering at Scale. She, she and her team do a phenomenal job. And what we did is we said, hey, this is a new industry. Um, let's, let's go study business to developer marketing in open source enterprise. Let's study how crypto networks and developers are working and thinking and interacting in the blockchain Ethereum landscape. And let's combine what we know about enterprise software and open source and B2D marketing, business to developer marketing, and combine it with these other practices. And that's kind of what we've built uh, is a model to try to just, you know, give support in the most effective, efficient way possible and keep developer user experience in mind. Because I think some people think developers just will chew through glass if they want, you know, if they want yeah. to deploy something. But the reality is if they have two options and one's really easy to deploy, the other one's really <laughs> painful to deploy and manage, they're going to use, you know, the first one. So for, that's for sure. And do you guys have, do you guys do uh, like bounties or grant programs as well? Or like, is there a wish list of what's still on the table that needs to be developed, created, built? Oh yeah. We have so many things uh, that, that, you know, that community contributions that, have been built and need and that will be built and improved. And, um, you know, recently, uh, yeah, there was a integration to Chainlink that was built. Um, we, uh, we did a integration with our weave that was community built and, you know, we'll keep launching these and we've got it. We've got a wish list, a bounty wish list, And, um, and we're going to start getting more and more of these out to get more and more scale tokens in the hands of more contributors. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's been great thus far, but I'm excited to just see even more like we, you know, there's a, uh, an initiative for a block explorer. There's an initiative for more, uh, uh, more wallet integrations that uh, there's. And so thankfully the foundation's able to kind of take in these uh, proposals for, for grants. And there's a lot of companies and people out there that are out building this stuff. Uh, chain flow is, is building a nice, uh, API for the network. Figment um, is building another uh, uh, tool for the network. And we're just seeing a lot of community contribution and we welcome more of it. So we, as much as we can get, please, please come and help. And uh, there's, there's a budget in terms of scale tokens that are just, just defined for developers in the community that want to build things that are valuable for the network. Great, great. I like that. And for all of you tuning in, right? Yeah, gather your team, follow scale. Um, you know, that's kind of the, everybody's goal in this space is to build cool shit. Um, so yeah. get out there. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I got one more last question in terms of mm -hmm. evolution. So like 2018 was financing, 2019 was shipping, 2020 was kind of weird, but 
uh, the, I think the pandemic escalated a lot of a lot of development, a lot of apps, a lot of ideas and concepts. What does 2021 have in store for for the industry and then also for scale? Yeah, I I think this is the year. And by the way, I, this is the year where we're going to see the growth happen that I thought was going to happen in 2020. Okay. I remember I was at DevCon, DevCon on stage giving my predictions for I was running a panel. And I think this is the year that we're going to see that user user centric growth. And I think we're seeing it. We saw DeFi boom. We saw yeah. NFTs are rocking and rolling. Gaming's really like picking up steam. Uh, but we, I think there's some really cool wallet features and like integrations into layer two scaling and uh, scalability platforms that will that are coming together where we're going to start seeing the user experiences just you know take a phenomenal. Uh, uh, you know, hit that growth curve, that knee of the curve, kind of what I talked about with mobile. Yeah. And I think, you know, user-owned economy and Web3 and uh, middleman disruption pro companies and projects, I think are going to be, you know, in the end of 2021, what we saw the middle of 2020 in terms of DeFi. So you'll start seeing these things like Brain Trust, for example, and, and these different platforms that are user-owned that disrupt these middleman environments really come into into play and you know they're they've been building you know that whole industry has been building for a long time too mines the uh, decentralized social network is a great example audius on the music side yeah these things are just gonna like just skyrocket this year that's my my feeling perfect perfect no no i, I believe that too i think kind of that web 2 2.0 for people that don't know kind of google it web 2.0 3.0 is um centralization to decentralization and kind of owner centric in, in, in every aspect. And that's kind of the direction we're going. Um, so we've kind of chatted for a while here, Jack. Um, I appreciate you like coming back on the show and like, you know, we hope to have you again. Um, where can, where should people find out more info about scale, uh, scale labs and or scale network? Yeah. I just recommend going to the scale network website, scale S K A L E dot network. You can find access to Twitter. You can follow me at Jack O'Halloran. Um, or at Scale Network, but you'll find all the social links, whether, you know, uh, developer community on Discord, community uh, centric uh, group on Telegram, and then, um, and there's other areas where you can come interact and, you know, just frankly be a part of the program. This is a user owned network. And, um, and so please, uh, please come join and, and support. Perfect, perfect. And, you know, that's kind of what Reimagine is all about the pandemic hit. You know, we're going on our seventh event. Um, obviously there's a demand for educational content, uh, video content, you know, one-on-one -on -one interviews, which, you know, we've tried to scale up, you know, and, <laughs> uh, and have a good time. And, and again, appreciate you joining. Um, you guys have supported us with workshops, with speakers. Um, and so we look to have you back and for everybody watching, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, we'll see you all again. Thank you.